All right. Good evening. Welcome. My name is Pat Kowitzel. I'm the buyer and author program coordinator at Magic City Books, and I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. We're very excited to welcome you back to another one of our uh, ongoing virtual author programs. If you're joining us for the very first time, welcome. Thank you for being here tonight and spending a little bit of time with us. Uh, we've been doing these programs virtually since April, and you know, the way things are looking right now, as, as optimistic as we are about, we were just talking right before we started about uh, some of the news about vaccines coming. Um, it's still probably a ways off before we're gathering in person. And so uh, we're gonna be doing virtual events into the spring and we're actually uh, starting to book up January and February right now. And so getting ready to announce some of our great new programs that are coming up. Uh, we have a couple more programs before uh, the holiday. And then uh, after the holiday, we we're, we're kind of, keeping it pretty small, but we do have just a few more programs left in 2020. This week on Wednesday, we're welcoming Denise Kiernan, who has written a book uh, about the Thanksgiving holiday, and uh, and we're really excited to welcome her back. She was in town for her most recent book uh, prior to this one about, um, uh, I think, the Biltmore Castle uh, or some big famous old house, one of the, one of the big castles in America. Um, anyway, Denise is joining us on Wednesday, on Thursday. We're going to be talking to the folks um, behind the Call Me Ishmael phone book, and that's a really uh, cool project uh, that has encouraged readers to call a number and kind of share stories about their reading life, and uh, it lists a lot of independent bookstores in the country and, and other little uh, just tidbits, and, and it's a really cool uh, holiday gift for, for the reader that has every book already. Um, this, is, this would be a great one for, for you. And then uh, right after... Uh, the holiday we've got, or excuse me, next Monday, we're, we're going to be welcoming Erin Brockovich and her new book, Superman's Not Coming, about the water crisis in America. Right after Thanksgiving, we're doing an event with ta Coates and, and Damon Lindelof. That event is our final ticketed event of the year, and uh, you can get tickets at magiccitybooks.com. And then finally, we're going to close out the year with Simon Hahn, former Tulsa Artist Fellow and uh, adjunct faculty at the University of Tulsa, and his new novel, um, Nights When Nothing Happened is getting a lot of attention, a lot of uh, very, very positive reviews, and it is coming out tomorrow. So he'll be in conversation with Charles Yu. And uh, for all the information about this stuff, you can visit magiccitybooks.com. Tonight, we are really excited to be welcoming Emily Contois, the, uh, a professor at the University of Tulsa, for the book launch event for her new book, Diners, Dudes, and Diets, How Gender and Power Collide in Food, Media, and Culture. The book demonstrates how the food, marketing, and media industries manipulated the concept of the dude in order to sell feminized food phenomena to men post-2000. She considers examples such as cookbooks, food TV, yogurts, and weight loss programs. She is also co-editing a volume on food and Instagram with Dr. Xenia Kish, also at the University of Tulsa. And tonight we are, uh, we're doubly lucky because uh, joining Emily in conversation is a good friend of hers, Anne Helen Peterson, who is the former senior culture writer for BuzzFeed and now uh, has her own newsletter, Culture Study, as a full-time venture on Substack. She has a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin, and her previous book, Too Fat, Too Slutty, Too Loud, and Scandals of the Classic Hollywood, were featured in NPR, Elle Magazine, and The Atlantic. And so uh, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Anne, Helen, and Emily and get out of the way with my copy of Diners, Dudes, and Diet. So... Thank you very much for joining us tonight and enjoy the show. All right. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be here. And then I, um, I have been doing book publicity for my own book. So I am just thrilled to be asking someone else questions all about them tonight. And I'm so excited that it's this book, which uh, is a book that is like absolutely something that is just right up my alley as someone who's a former academic, as someone who is obsessed with the intersections of gender and pop culture, as someone who loves to read uh, academic writing that is made accessible to larger audiences. Like this is just a phenomenal book for all of those reasons. Um, and I think Emily and I talked a little bit before about how sometimes you come to these events and you're like, how do these two people know each other? Like. Was it totally random? Like, I, th did they pick this person out of a hat? And wanted, we actually have like kind of a fascinating several different intersections. So we thought we would start with that. Um, Emily, why don't you go first? 
go. Thanks so much for being here, Annie. I'm so glad that I get to do this with you. Um, and thanks to Pat and to Magic City Books. Um, if I can do one short story before we tell Annie's story, I interviewed for this job to you exactly three years ago today. And one of the places that they drove me around to was Magic City Books right before it opened, saying that's where we could all have our book launch parties. Um, and so it's been so exciting, right, to join a city that number one had an awesome independent bookstore. Tulsa luckily has a couple. Um, so just like so excited that this is happening and that it's happening here. Uh, and so Annie and I, like I grew up in Billings, Montana. So I think we had a mutual friend. Like, so I knew Carissa and you guys were in a sorority at Whitney. Like you guys are connected there. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's how I followed your amazing Facebook page, Celebrity Gossip Academic Style, which as you were saying at the beginning, right? We've both been interested in this like academic side to the mundane, the popular and the mediated. Um, and so it was always this really fun space to follow what you were thinking and what you were doing and what you were writing. And then when I was at Brown doing my PhD, you were one of the scholars we invited to campus for this essay in public seminar series of academics who were doing exactly that. How do you write for the public in these different ways? And then last year, we were lucky enough to bring you to TU. Um, you came to a couple of classes. Um, my students read uh, The Rising Rain of the Unruly Woman, which was so fun to have you come speak with them. And it was right after you'd first, you'd written the first essay for Can't Even about millennial burnout. And so you were still sort of thinking, it was like right after you'd gotten the book contract and you hadn't started writing yet. So those have sort of been the moments that we've crossed. Yeah, and I, um... One of my favorite essays that I've ever written for my newsletter, which I now do full time, is was prompted by my visit to Tulsa. And, you know, I stayed downtown. And also when I <laughs> when, you know, a couple of the professors were driving me around town, they were like, look at the bookstore. You need to come to Tulsa to do your next book event. And also just other places that we went in town. And I, I did a couple of long runs around the city. And I am super fascinated with Tulsa as a city where it is in this moment, the growth and the kind of the coolification in some ways of, of Tulsa. Um, so it is a place that I am desperate to get back to as soon as travel is available to us as well. And um, so one of the things that I think is like, it's so weird how they're, how books that are coming out in this moment feel resonant in entirely new ways. Like there's all these balances that are added onto them because of not only the pandemic, but also the recession. So I was not, I just did not remember that people called the great recession, the man session. Uh -huh. and, and I know, and I think that like the way that I have been reintroduced to that idea is that people have been calling our current recession a a she session, which is a horrible word, right? But it tr just trying to get at the fact that this current recession, the people who are predominantly losing the jobs are women and women of colors more specifically. And that during the previous recession, it was a lot more men who were losing the job, their jobs. And so can you just talk for people who maybe aren't as, like haven't read your book yet about that intersection of the man session and the emergence of the figure you call the dude? So the dude started to emerge around the turn into 21st century. It's like 2000s where we start seeing some of these big shifts. That's the year that for the first time, 20% of married women are earning more than their husbands. It's the year that like married women's educational attainment, right, passes men. Um, it's when we, when we elect George W. Bush, right, in part because of the beer test, right? He is this dude president who then embarks upon, you know, cowboy diplomacy after 9-11. So we have these changes happening in gender, in politics. Um, but then the recession like kicks all of this into overdrive that we have men who for so long have been defined by their ability to be breadwinners, to be competitive, to be strong, to be successful. Um, and so these expectations of gender are always unreasonable. They're always out of reach. They're always ideals. But the context of the recession made it even more impossible. And so it's in that moment that you see things like dude food take off. Right, like the, when you do Google and Gram viewer, viewer for dude, for dude food, and for bacon weave, like they all follow the same pattern. So it's within this foodscape 
that we're renegotiating like what it means to be a real man within an economic context where maybe you can't buy a house, you can't get a job and you have to go back and live with your parents. Um, so I think about it within the context of specifically millennials, right? A similar argument that you make that like this was more profound for a particular generation, but definitely impacted, right? Men across the age spectrum, as I argue that like dude can kind of apply to a lot of different moments in life, even though we think of it as this sort of youthful identity. Do you remember growing up in Billings and in Montana more generally, um, any kind of like hints at this, at these discourses emerging? Because I think a lot of times an interesting thing as, as historians and as gender and pop culture historians is when we look back and we're like, oh wait, I lived through that. And like, I didn't have a critical lens to understand what was going on with it at the time, but it was very much there. And I was swimming in it when I was in my late teens, early twenties, that sort of thing. Yeah, so I think what I find interesting about the dude is that he's reactionary. I think Sarah Benet Weiser has this amazing book on like popular misogyny and she's saying like that's happening at the same time as popular feminism, which is like, happening in the 2010s. And so I honestly like I don't remember back to dudish things, but I remember like Britney Spears and this like tanorexic ideal that I was under right as a woman growing up right like I started high school in 1999. So like that was my high school experience right but like that's who we were all supposed to look and feel like. And so it the same time that that's happening there's these similarly unreasonable sort of ideas for men um, but like coke zero comes out in 2005 right like as i'm starting college like all of these foods were happening um but with food network right like that's 1997 so like all the changes happening in food programming happened a little bit earlier and then they hit the food space um and then they just kept happening like the yogurts that i'm looking at they're in like the 2010s um, so one of my students was asking me, like, we know what was frustrating about writing the book? And I was like, some of the stuff I found, right? Like these things that we think we are so over, right? Like it's 2020, like we don't do that anymore. Like, um, read my book, like really sadly, like we're still stuck in these really conventional gender norms that some people are like, oh, it's so 1950s. And then, you know, my real historians are like, oh, it's Victorian, right? Like we're stuck in masculine, feminine, public, private, the world of work and the world of home. Um, that the book's trying to like break down those binaries to show how they work, how they work in tandem, and how they are still with us, and they shouldn't be. Uh, can you talk about one of my favorite phrases, which is gender contamination? <laughs> so how is, how is gender contamination working with a lot of these products that show up over the course of the book? Yeah, so this is a marketing term, the idea that if a product is sort of feminized, men aren't going to buy it. So Coke executives said this, right? That a diet is a four letter word in that 18 to 34 demographic for men, right? They don't want to buy Diet Coke, but they do want a low soda for their health goals or for whatever, but they're not going to buy these things that are perceived. So whether it was yogurt or going on Weight Watchers or buying a cookbook, there was this perception that these things were contaminated with their feminization, that men weren't going to buy them. So if you're ever going to be able to expand your target market, you're going to have to thwart that. You're going to have to be able to combat it. And so I say that the dude, right, with his like cool insincerity, the distance that he creates, he makes it so men could move through this world of food and the domestic world, but not um, have it impinge upon like the prowess and stability of his masculinity because he didn't really care about any of it. Right. Well, and so you talk a little bit about like the way that whiteness intersects with these understandings of the dude, like what, not all dudes are white, but like there is some implicit understandings of hegemonic white masculinity that are going on. When I was reading the history of just like what uh, basically backlashes to men caring about their figure, it made me think so much of a lot of the research I did about Rudolf Valentino, who was this massive silent star of the early 20th century, so like 1920s. And a lot of the discourses, the negative discourses that, that emerged around him were like, he's really into like taking care of himself, both in terms of shaping his body. Like he was, he was very much uh, in that, like uh, the new kind of fitness school that was circulating at that time, but also um, that he was an immigrant and had like this like swarthy Latin Italian understood like different fan magazines coded him slightly differently, um, even though he was he was Italian. And so how do you see like a through line going through in terms of like othering like other people, people who are not like the white masculine ideal 
care about their appearance and are part of this sort of these discourses of dudeness who, who you know, the disaffectation. Yeah, so another binary I'm looking at is like consumption and production. This mm -hmm. idea that like to consume was feminine and to produce was masculine. And so we see that like all the way back to that sort of first big moment of gender crisis for men at the end of the 19th century with the rise of corporate capitalism, big waves of immigration, of urbanization, changing you know where we live, how we relate to one another, um, and then changing work patterns. Um, and so lots of scholars have looked at that moment to say like that was a crisis of particularly white masculinity. So like early bodybuilding was about maintaining and building up like the strength of particular white masculinity masculinity when all these new immigrants were coming in and when there was this fear that different ways of working were like going to destroy masculinity right? that men were becoming become feminized because our culture was becoming feminized was the fear right that it was all about consumption and buying instead of creating things right of working the land or right of building something with your hands right like we still have this sort of panic right are we really americans if we don't make anything anymore um that i see that concern sort of mapped on both gender and race. Um, and so the dude in holding up, right, this prowess and authority of masculinity, he is, he's tied up in those race, sort of that racial hierarchy as well, that it's about whiteness. Um, even though, right, like there are female dudes, like I cite your um, chapter on like Alana Glazer and um, Oh, help me with the name, right? But like they were female dudes. Like that's one of the F words in the book, right? That they could F around, right? Like they could just do whatever they wanted. Like it's the it's a privilege to be a dude. Um, and so they're one of those sort of few examples of like women getting to have that kind of authority. Um, right. It's like it's gender and then race. And how does Christianity intersect with this, especially in the early 20th century? Like I have this big highlight in my copy of the book around like Christian fitness, essentially, which I feel like there's a real line between Christian fitness discourses and CrossFit. Um, so I would love to hear more about that. Yes, yeah, so at the same time, we've had the physical culture movement, uh, which, you know, sort of that turn of the century and then into the early 20th century, there was this like muscular Christianity. It was this same fear that like, the church was losing membership. And so the idea that like there were church ladies and so the church was also becoming feminized. Um, and so that was a concern, right? Like other historians, right? Are way more expert on that than me. But like, I've written about like the religiosity of like secular dieting, right? Like, there's definitely like religious dieting where it's like a part of your faith and it's done in the church. But I was always interested in, you know, sinfully delicious and guilt-free, like where this like religious language and framework comes from um, for these sort of destructive rules we make about food. Um, so I see that link as well of like religiosity and it's like disciplining of the body, the disciplining of the soul um, and the concern about sin and temptation and rise and fall. Um, that that's also sort of a big part of this diet culture piece of the book too. So does this, you, I've read a lot about um, these concerns about the office, essentially feminizing men in particular, that really um, start around the turn of the century with modernity in, in the United States, but then they seem to really reemerge post World War II in the 40s, like the 50s and the 60s, and just a general fear that like that offices are sucking all of like the masculinity out of men, and there, you know there's a lot going on with that, but. Um, I, I was struck looking though at your historical research about things like Weight Watchers and how like men were part of these programs. Like it took a while for these diet conglomerates or, or enterprises to be so fully coded as feminine. Can you expand on that a little? Yeah, so I went back to sort of like the newspaper archives and, you know, looking at some of those first cookbooks coming out of Weight Watchers, which is incorporated in 1963. Um, but it's not just Jean Nidich, right? Like we often like only talk about her as this like figurehead, um, but it was her and her husband and another couple um, who were sort of like the business side of it all. So they were two men and two women, and then she's just this spokesperson. And the language that she used was actually pretty gender neutral, right? Like she would talk about, you know, the weight afflicted and like the fat, right? Like they weren't nice words, but they weren't gendered words that were just about women. Um, there were in the cookbook, right, there's like a diet for men that gives you like another piece of bread, two ounces of, you know, an extra two ounces of fish or whatever. Um, so men were always there, right? Like historians are often, right, we go back to the record, like, you know, where were the women? Where were the people of color? Where were, you know, the subaltern? Like, where were they? How do we help them speak? And so I went back 
and did that, but like, where were the men without centering their power, right? Like, how do we see how these men were always a part of the program, but they aren't specifically targeted with their own programming or sort of really specific marketing messaging until the 21st century. And then all of a sudden, Weight Watchers becomes a default woman program and Weight Watchers Online for Men is this men's program. So they were always there, you know, 10% or less, but they're consistently there um, trying to find a space, right? This idea of like this taboo to be a man who wants to lose weight and wants help, right? Like you can lose weight on your own and like lift stuff in the gym and like, you know, muscle up on your own and like that's the manly way to look after your body but if you want to go talk about your feelings that are related to food that are related to psychological trauma if you want help with that if you want community like then that's not a manly thing even though in like the scientific studies that can would compare weight watchers to things like south beach or you know a low carb a low fat right in scientific studies what often helped with weight watchers like empirically was that social support and that's the thing we tell men you're not allowed to have that Although, okay, so this is the segue I've been waiting to make. Um, and it's just because, so I um, I have a history of disordered eating and have like spent a lot of time thinking about just the ways that I like thought so much about eating um, for a long time in my life. And it's, it's you know, like anyone with the disordered eating, it takes a long time to, to emerge from those practices and you're never really actually ever free from them, I don't think. Um, but- I think I've been subconsciously avoiding online discussions of intermittent fasting because I just didn't, like, I think my brain just didn't want to go there. And I was scrolling Facebook yesterday and like a podcast group that I'm part of, someone was asking questions about intermittent fasting and about like, and then there were all of these answers about their, their intermittent fasting and their husbands and like strategies that they use. And to me, it read like, at just a textbook of all of the things that young women said online and in and in real life to each other when you were basically telling like teaching your body not to be hungry so that you wouldn't eat and i understand that there are there are actual health reasons that people have to intermittent intermittent fast for different reasons and also it is connected to to some parts of, of religiosity and in different capacities but i think that I just saw so much that was like a masculinized version of some disordered eating habits. And so that has become a way that men can maybe talk about, you know, it's, it's coded as fitness, it's coded as wellness. And so you can talk about it in an online forum, you can talk about it on Facebook, you can talk about it. And as you discuss in your book, stuff like paleo, which are very restrictive, oftentimes in gender disordered eating habits, diets, because, they have been masculinized in that way. So anywhere you want to go with that, I, I'm so eager to hear about it. Yes, I've always wanted to write about this and just haven't had time yet. That like part of this intermittent fasting comes out of the same sort of like tech bro culture that like wanted Soylent, right? Like I am a man who codes, I don't have time for like the feminized body to hold me back, right? I don't have time to cook and clean up and do all of these sort of labors that have been feminized as well. So the yeah. idea of, um, I think, you know, like the, the classical Cartesian dualism, right? Of like the glorious masculine mind and this gross connected to the body feminine thing, right? Like the body, right? Um, and so I see that intermittent fasting as like reproducing that kind of an understanding, right? That I need to be free of like my bodily desires that make me weak, right? That I need to stop and I need to, you know, quell this hunger and look after myself. Um, so it sort of lays over, right? Like all those masculine ideals of um, appetite. So like, that's what's funny, right? So it's appetite that is like supremely controlled, right? And like, that's what makes, it, makes fasting masculine. But in all the dieting stuff that I looked at in this 20 year period that wasn't about fasting, um was actually about the, this convention that like men have these like manly big appetites right that deserve to be satisfied with meat and potatoes and so weight watchers wasn't gonna ever 
right? Show pictures of salad. Like they only marketed dude food to men, right? Like you are going to eat pizza and beer and tacos and you're just going to track it. And the weight's just magically going to fall off. Like you're not going to change what you eat. You are not going to internalize this panopticon, right? You're not going to surveil it. Like you're just going to lose the weight and like, dude, off you go, right? Like that was the message for men to sell the exact same program that they sold to women. That was about this deep psychological work uh, that you had to sort of indoctrinate yourself within. Um, so there's that difference, right? In the conception of like masculine appetite and how to control it and to serve it. Um, Cause another piece that like was in the book but it didn't make sense, so it got spun off into an essay. I'm sure you'll know um, the hairpin essay of photo essay of women laughing alone with salad of like all these, you know, really sad stock images of women just like gleefully eating like, you know, lettuce with like tomatoes, right? There's no dressing, there's no cheese, there's no nuts, there's no anything, right? Like this is what one of my students called sad salad, right? Like this only makes you sad. It just fills you up with water. And so there I argue it's this like expectation for women to not have an appetite, right? That our joyful pursuit is of lack right? That we don't have appetites for food. We're not supposed to have sexual appetites, right? Like all these conventions about like how female appetite is supposed to be performed. While men, right, are like supposed to be voracious. That's like a part of how you perform masculinity. And so what I loved, particularly with the diet sodas, a little bit with the yogurts and then into the dieting, is that these industries had to come up with non-diet diet food, right? Like it's still diet food, but like it had to be non-diet. Um, so I talk about the concept of zero, right? That like, that is this like empowered, full, satisfying, like nutrition informed from science, right? Like that's dieting for men. And so I argue that like, if you took like some of that and marketed it to women, like it would be slightly more empowering, but you'd still be encouraging us to diet, which is still screwed up. Um, but you can see the stark differences in how they would market the same things to men and women based on these understandings, right? About appetite, about power, about bodies, about flavors, about textures, about how much we're supposed to eat. That is this layered understanding of how we see these really conventional ideas just stacked onto each other. So we have a, we have a question from um, the Q&A. Anyone can ask these. We're gonna keep doing them throughout the panel. So please, please be, please uh, give us more in the Q&A. It's just on the bottom of your screen. It says, congrats, Emily. Your book is one of the treats I've been saving for break next week. I love the idea of gender contamination. And I see that you talk about Dr. Pepper 10 in a book, uh, in the book in chapter three, and wonder if you might riff off those campaigns a little and their seeming failure. It seemed to me like the appeal to masculinity in those ads was weirdly acknowledging the gender panic about diet foods and trying to make it funny, align the brand with a rejection of the idiocy that drinking diet soda ought to be unacceptably feminine, but it didn't quite work. Yeah, so Dr. Pepper 10 launches with this commercial that is like an action movie. Um, so it's a guy like running through the forest with big bulging biceps with this like weird laser gun um, saying, you know, hey ladies, like, are you liking the show? Like, of course you're not. This isn't your movie and this isn't your soda, right? That like the tagline is literally it's not for women, right? They lean in so hard to this idea that like this is not like, they, you know, it's not a lady drink. This is not a chick flick. This is not a lady drink. Like this is, this is for you and you should be able to drink it. And so like the dude, yeah, there's this humor there's this wink right like there's an irony to it um, but I actually learned a lot from um, reading feminist scholars who are analyzing gaming and Gamergate and sort of how gender and race and sexuality all get negotiated in these gaming virtual spaces um, and one of the arguments that she made is that even if it's a joke <laughs> like the world in which women live <laughs> is patriarchal and full of assault and full of all sorts of inequities so so your joke doesn't happen in a vacuum. Like your joke happens in the real world. Your ad campaign for your soda happened in the real world um, where so many things are still treated like they're not for women, right? Like, you know, being professors, and be, right? They're like still what we imagine, right? Is the white guy in tweed behind the podium. Um, so as we think about, right, where in the world there is this equity and equality for women. Um, and Dr. Pepper, so that's the ad, but Dr. Pepper Tan also had 
the like report they it was in these early days right 2011 like how would you use social media data in a advertising campaign so they claimed that they'd scraped all this data of like what is the most manly and so you could do this quiz you know like what's most manly like a, and they were silly right like a dirty sock or a baseball glove you know like there were these silly comparisons and you find out who would win but there was also like this gamified area where you could um you know shoot things and they were all symbols of femininity right that you could shoot like lipstick you could shoot you know that there was this violence right this first person shooter sort of gamification to shoot at feminine symbols um and you supposedly couldn't get into it unless you had like a female ident or a male identified account right so women couldn't even come in couldn't even be part of it um which is similar to powerful yogurt which is one of the yogurts that i analyze in the book uh, that literally has six pack abs chiseled into the side every container um and one of their gamified right like dudes who play they don't really work they have all these funny things um was like a website you know plug-in where like if you did crunches like that's how you would scroll your page but then when you got to the end of it like you were rewarded um with these sort of semi-pornographic pictures of women um that like there was this like very deep misogyny kind of built into like yeah sure it's a joke sure it's playful and i'm like eh. It's not just right like there's still more to it that it's doing some harm um powerful yogurt also launched their yogurt at the, sort of the big expo on the west coast for like new natural products um with a booth exhibit that brought a lot of people to it um, where they would do an ultrasound of your tummy so you can see the abs inside right like everyone has a six pack on an ultrasound but the woman conducting it right is a woman in a nurse's costume right a sexy nurse costume like you'd wear to a halloween party um, so again, right, this is sort of, you know, deeply misogynistic representation of women, like that is straight up their pitch as they're marketing diet soda and yogurt to men. <laughs> like, yeah. That was frustrating to spend 10 years studying, like, are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, and when you're doing this sort of discourse analysis, like oftentimes things like that ad campaign are, are lost to history. Like not a lot of people are excavating those things or, or have a, a, a deep memory of them, but they are so, they're just part of this larger cultural fabric. And like you get to look at, and do this close analysis of all of these different things that are manifesting and operating in them. One thing I, I think other people will be curious about too, I, my mom, and I think a lot of people of um, our parents' generation have different, uh, different foods, I think, signify differently to them than, than our generation. So like my mom is always like cottage cheese is a diet food, right? Like it was just so thoroughly coded as diet food over the course of the 60s, 70s, 80s. Are there, but I don't think it's that way now. Like I think now it's almost like, oh, it's protein. Like it can be, it's like a health food, quote unquote. Are there some foods that you have watched even over the course of a hundred years, like just be become like signify differently, like evolve in their signification. Yeah, I love the example of cottage cheese. That's a great one. Um, back to the sad salads, like what I track in that essay is how we get, so it's a much shorter period of time, right? But how we get from sort of the 80s and 90s and the low fat moment of these like sad salads being like the ultimate diet salad or the ultimate diet food, right? So they talk about like salad fatigue for women, right? Like how do we make salads exciting? If this is what you're eating like every single day. Um, and so you see how that gets re-signified with like power bowls, right? So like that's the application of zero onto the salad that we are now pull, you know, pumping full of, you know, quote unquote, ancient at all, um, right, this, and then, you know, ideas of sort of cheese and special seeds, right, that now we have all these superfoods, right, that operate in this very different way. They argue like diet foods were always about lack, right, they were about the pursuit of nothingness, of just sort of like quelling your hunger and wellness which you know some people say is like exactly the same as diet culture i write about it as like a diet culture supposedly harmless cousin um that it is right so similar um that like wellness does try to adopt that language of like a power empowerment right that like this is a salad that is like fulfilling it has all these good things in it it's offering you all of these nutrients instead of just giving you the cat the, the salad that's like negative calorie eating right like that's what was popular like when we were in high school 
right? It's like you figured out the diet that like you are eating so much fiber, but the time your body digests it, like it's literally like less than zero calories, right? Like that's celery. Celery. I remember like conversations about like, oh, you burn calories eating celery. Exactly. And so I feel like that doesn't happen as much anymore. Um, but like celery, like, you know, food historians, kids, I mean, it was like in vogue, it was very fancy, right? Like it stood in for all sorts of things. Um, and so I think the salad though, the salad steak sort of dichotomy, like that's been with us for almost the entire 20th century. Um, sort of the salad being the food that women could eat when they went out on their own, particularly with like the rise of the department store and like this is space for women, you could dine out. Out while you were shopping. So I mean, that has white racial and class politics attached to it as well. But the idea of the salad, right, being what you would eat in those kinds of spaces or have tea. Um, that no, this salads, right, like you could write about salads forever. Salads and steak, there's like so much to dig apart there. It's so binary, it's so simple, but there's so much complexity and ambiguity to dig apart. I think so much about like the, um, you know, like the sweet green salad, the chopped salad, like these salads that I think have really become like a normalized component of, of bourgeois office work mm-hmm. of like, how can I get something that takes a really long time to eat, right? So you feel like you are getting this nourishment, but especially at places like Sweet Green, like it has the calories next to it. So you can be like, okay, only 400 calories. Like this is still like a, a good health decision. Um, but really just that idea of like a, a food item, almost as a, like a labor that can coincide with you eating it still at your desk while you're like trying to be productive in all of these other ways of your life while being as optimized as possible. Um, good segue here into another comment or question. She, um, Garrett asked, how central is meat in all of this? And what's the deal with protein? I am also curious. Yes. So with dude food, I argue like meat is one of these like central elements that are defining it. Um, I love to show the picture. It's called the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse Burger. It's from Burger's Priest in Canada. And so it's like two gigantic patties and two gigantic onion rings, um, like some lettuce and a bunch of cheese. And then there are no buns, but there are grilled cheese sandwiches on the top and the bottom. So it's like a burger so big, you couldn't actually eat it. Um, But like, of course, the meat is there. Um, So I adore Carol J. Adams' work, right? This foundational work of eco-criticism where she argues that the slaughter of animals and the eating of meat right is part and parcel with like producing masculinity like that is what meat does Um, and then she stretches it further right to say that animals um, are sort of disciplinized and subordinated at the same time that women are treated like pieces of meat Um, so it's never just about meat and animals that she reads it through that lens of sort of gendered power as well which I find really powerful Um, but with protein um, I have this term that I call the macronutrient imaginary um, in that like protein has so much cultural meaning like it just circulates on its own and so in these decades, sort of like 2010, particularly to 2020, like protein is this like symbol for totalized wellness, right? Like protein is the one nutrient that's not bad after we went through low fat in the 80s and 90s, after we went through low carb in the 2000s, like protein is this only good nutrient in a foodscape that feels so anxious for a lot of eaters, right? Of like, what can I eat, you know, when you're trying to follow different advice? And so protein has this like natural health halo because of that. But what I find so fascinating with so many people studying, right, um, alternative meats and cell-based meats and all of these, you know, alternative proteins that are just taking over, right, not just the meat area, but like all throughout the supermarket, this idea that we're going to have fake eggs and, you know, blue algae that, you know, all these different sources of protein. So what I see as like American eaters, right, which for the most part eat way more protein than we need, right, that like that is a symbol of sort of American exception and affluence that like we eat protein and we have lots of it available and that is a part right like during covid right trump made sure we kept the meat packing plants open right there had to be meat fully stocked right. in every grocery store in america like that's who we are meat was this really important symbol to know that our food system was going to be safe and it was going to be abundant like that right of course he would right know what meat signifies and why it's important Um, But like what I see with us getting really obsessed with all these plant-based sources is like we're not letting go of all those logics behind protein. 
Like we're still obsessed with having um, that sort of secure, large consumption of this nutrient that we think stands in for ideas about gender, about class, um, and in sort of like a broader geopolitical perspective, right? Of like what it means to be this American nation where everybody eats well, that like protein, you know, if we want to be historical, like all the way back to those first big waves of immigrants from Italy, from Russia, from, you know, from Ireland, like the ability to eat well in the United States was to be able to eat meat regularly, right? Like Italian American cuisine is like rooted in what that meat meant, right? That if you were coming, right, you were from, you know, a peasant from Italy, come to the United States, like you could eat like a king, right, when you got here. So meat has that historical value that has deep sort of ethnic racial ties, big class component, and then of course this big gendered idea um, about masculinity. Um, Warren Velasco was one of like my dearest mentors and he took, he did this whole class on meat at BU, like you could literally teach the class just on this question, it's just infinitely fascinating. I feel like there are huge ties with Trumpism too, you know, just in the, like the discourses around like, oh, well, Trump, like he doesn't, all he eats is like burgers and steaks and like a steak well done, which has connotations uh, <laughs> that circle around it as well. But then also like Jordan Peterson and a lot of the the people on the, like the internet dark web and they, like the, the steak diets and trying to, to really make America meat eaters again, I guess, for, for lack of a better word. But I think that that is, is a symptom of this generalized feeling that like masculinity is again under threat because it's always under threat. And even just like the insult, like that, that people on people from the far right lobby around the web of like a soy boy, right? It's referring like you are, you are a fake protein. Like you are a person who is not man enough to eat meat. So I just, it is startling to me every day how resonant these, these ideas remain. No, absolutely. Um, another question. Okay. I always want to hear about Guy Fieri. During the pandemic, he is home and cooking. What happens to him and his meaning when he isn't on the road eating in diners? I actually analyze part of his meaning is like through fatherhood and home, right? That like part of the reason he's read as this transgressive figure, right, is that he's this dude chef who like wears shorts and has his spiked hair and he's always talking so loudly, right? He pushes back against these expectations for a celebrity chef, um, for a food star, um, and for like a real man, right? He pushes back against all of that. But one of the ways that he renders himself in bounds and acceptable and wholesome is through fatherhood. So even from the first episode, right? Even as his audition tape, right? He always talks about his sons, right? Like fatherhood is in everything that he does. Um, when he's cooking in the fields, you know, during the California wildfires, right? Like his children are there, he's teaching them how to be men and how to be Americans. Um, so him at home, I actually think is really important um, that not on diners, drive-ins and dives, but on a lot of his other programs, he really centers this idea that he cooks to feed his family, that he is this like dude rocker chef, um, but like that's his role. So he actually gives us some interesting space to think about men cooking more at home and being the one who cooks to feed their families, not just to sort of show off, right? Or sort of, you know, cooks, you know, special something, you know, for Thanksgiving or on Sundays or something like, he's the person who feeds his family. And I think in that way, he actually gives us something to ponder. Yeah. Another question, is the concept of the dude particularly Western? How are masculinity and um, femininity related to food in other parts of the world? Great question. Yeah, I would argue that yes, like because of the privilege, like really resonating within the dude, um, that he, yeah, that there is this Americanness to it, or at least that he would resonate um, in a place that had sort of similar sort of demographics and sort of um, situations of comfort. Uh, interestingly enough, there's a lot of dude food in Australia, right? Which is my other country and one sort of similar to us. Um, and then when I first started, I was looking at some stuff with milk. Um, so it's in, oh, like right around 2010, there is this like sports nutrition survey or, you know, study that shows that milk is like the perfect post-workout food, right? It has the right amount of carbs, the right amount of protein, the right amount of fat, that like, this is what you should be drinking, right? Like it's the opposite of Anchorman. Like it is the right choice, right? For like after your workout to like, you know, build up all of your muscles. Um, and so then we see this proliferation of 
milk, right? That is sportified, right? It's no longer for little kids, like is a part of school lunch or connected to moms, right? Like milk becomes this like manly sports nutrition beverage. Um, and so a lot of the shakes that we see now, um, and so powerful yogurt that I looked at in the book, right? Like they weren't coming out to compete with Activia or, you know, Yoplait. Like they were coming out to compete with muscle milk, right? Like they were bringing the protein of Greek yogurt to be able to compete in that really growing um, supplement space because of this obsession we have with protein. Um, so that's a piece of that too, um, of, of that milk playing out that way. Um, okay, so that was, so my point there was, was that when I was talking about this milk work, I had friends who sent me examples like from Sweden, from Ireland, like there were definitely other countries in Europe um, that were doing this sort of like manly milk concept. Um, but a really excellent question, right? I haven't looked very much to think about, um, you know, how does this play out in Asia? How does this play out in South America? Um, and, you know, all around the world that this would be, I hope the dude masculinity concept, right? Like it might be applicable to think about how does it operate um, within different cultures, different time periods in spaces outside of food as well. Absolutely. Oh, so this is an interesting one. You mentioned 2000 as a benchmark year where 20% of women earn more than their spouses. Uh, this earning disparity is one marker for child abuse and incest in a family. How much of the dude food movement is a tribal reaction to more powerful women the glorification of male sexuality through unlimited male access to food and focus on the male body, um, basically through like excess, you know, eating, drinking, farting, vomiting, like in the hangover movies, for example. That's really interesting. Like this, this excessive male body, unruly male body re reasserting its masculinity in, in these films of this time. Yeah, so I definitely see it as part of a reactionary backlash, right, to increasing women's power. Um, but I think what's interesting about the dude compared to like a more conventionally masculine sort of identity um, is that he maintains like the privilege of that conventionally masculine guy, right, who might be violent and like maintain his territory. Um, that like the dude is going to have all that privilege, but like do it by like slacking. Right, like <laughs> dude, right? Like the dude's not gonna hit somebody. Like it's right. a different way of maintaining that privilege um, without rocking the boat. Um, so it introduces this like flexibility for like some men who already hold a lot of privilege, right? To not feel like they have to hold up to those standards. Um, but it does nothing, right? To dismantle the broader gender hierarchy that oppresses women. Um, so one of the examples that I look at a little bit is the idea of the dad bod. Right. So the idea uh, that this body is one that, you know, still works out regularly. There are muscles, um, but this is a body that like eats a full pizza and a six pack of beer at a time. Right. Like it's a body that um, is not, you know, trying to be lean and to look like the cover of a fitness magazine. Um, it's a body that is just fine as it is. Right. Eating what it wants, um, but is still right productive and sort of understood as generally healthy. Right. That it's not othered as this like like truly unhealthy body. Um, and so thinking about how there's increasingly like more forgiveness, um, right? There's always been, right? More forgiveness for men to have these bodies that don't adhere um, to ideals, bodies, I know you've read about this, like that are allowed to age, that are allowed to be considered attractive as they age, right? While women are always held to these ideals of thinness and youthfulness and um, that that doesn't hold similarly. But I did look at a lot of sociological research that did say that like men are even, they're more concerned about their bodies now than they were in the past. Mm -hmm. um, that there were some psychologists in the eighties that came up with this concept of normative discontent for women. The idea that it is just a part of being a woman to hate your body, right? Because you live in this culture that is always telling you that it's not good enough. And so there are a number, right? A research team saying like, this is the reality for men too, right? It is normal to be really dissatisfied with your body. Um, and so in a media space, like I map that over the rise of the Marvel, you know, cinematic universe mm -hmm. of all of these, you know, superhero bodies front and center in tights and, you know, really tight clothing, but also like even the dude superheroes are ripped, right? So um, to see Chris Pratt go from Andy on Parks and Rec, right? They literally have to write him a line that like, oh, I just stopped drinking beer for a summer and I lost 50 pounds. And like, that's how I went and did this movie and now I'm totally ripped. Um, so there were a couple of examples like that where we see the guy next door turn into the man of steel. Um, so I try to read that as generously as I can. I think the thing I always tell my students is like patriarchy oppresses all of us, right? Not all of us equally, not by a long shot, 
but it oppresses all of us and patriarchy is bad for men um that i want a world where men get to just be who they are um and think their bodies are okay um and so at the same time that i am frustrated by the inequitable sort of um you know, rules, social rules about what men and women are supposed to look like. I still want that to be better for everybody, kinder for everybody. You know, and I've heard a lot of um, these like discourses about like normative discontent um, within uh, the the male gay community. And I think this a question in the, the Q&A is how important is sexuality in this? Um, is there a difference? I think like thinking through what is like how uh, gender norms and how the performance of, of dieting and, and restriction and even like achieving a certain uh, standard, how, it, like, is there a, a, a gay dude? Like, how does that work? Yeah. Okay, so when we look at the entire right LGBTQ community, right, like white gay men do hold a disproportionate amount of power, right? Mm -hmm. We think about the issues that are put forward, um, the incomes they tend to have, um, the general safety they tend to have compared to, for example, right, people of color who are trans, mm -hmm. um, that they have that disproportionate amount of privilege. So like maybe there could be a dude in that space. But I think what I write about in the book is the idea that like dude food, for example, like it's not just masculinizing everything, it is heterosexualizing everything, right? That you can prove that like, I am not just a real man, right? I am a straight man and like, don't get confused just because I'm cooking. Um, and so, you know, tracking sort of these ideas of masculine identity with consumption, um, that when you get to the metrosexual and then the gastrosexual, right? That this is fine a, um, a formation of masculinity that is very comfortable with consumption um, and that knowledge about food and knowledge about cooking becomes this part um, that can definitely cross this uh, straight uh, and gay binary, um, but that it became acceptable within that straight space for food and food knowledge to sort of circulate. Um, but yeah, sexuality, right? The heteronormativity of it is like so profound. Like there've definitely been studies that even in, um, you know, gay and lesbian families, right? Of like who does the food labor, right? Like the heteronormative norms are so strong that they also sort of organize those labor patterns in those families, which is bonkers. Yeah, I just think how far we've come in some ways uh, from like the the dad in Rebel Without a Cause who like the way that you know he's feminized is he's wearing an apron. Like, and that's why James Dean is so sad, right? Is because of yeah. his feminized dad to like all of these profiles of like tech bros cooking bread, right? Because it can be- yes, It can be scientific yeah. and like quickly <laughs> measured, right? Like baking, right? Is very specific and scientific and manly, yeah. Yeah. Um, so for our last question, I am so curious, you know, there are so many different uh, conversations about food and gender that are happening right now during the pandemic and that, you know, there's just no way I've written books like I know there's just no way you can include them in the book. So what are you seeing? And like, if you, if someone right now was like, okay, add another chapter to this book, what would you add? And it could be, it doesn't have to be about dudes either. It could be something, a new book. Yeah, so I think one thing that I got to do, um, Coca-Cola retired Tab in October, right? Which was their first diet soda that came out in 1963. Um, and so the, you know, I had to turn in copy edits in April, right? So it's like, what, like Coca-Cola, right? Something changes like every day at Coca-Cola. So trying to track what happened with Diet Coke and Coke Zero, right? That story keeps changing. Um, so I did, right, get to write this essay for Jezebel of sort of talking about what happened with Diet Coke um, that they tried to reposition it, right? Is this like cool millennial beverage, right? So they, um, so in the conclusion, I track how each of these brands, right, have how are they still working with the dude, right? So some of them have like dropped a focus on gender altogether. Some of them have like extended the dude to everyone thinking that's the right move. Um, and then some have like gone backwards, right? Like um, the yogurts went backwards <laughs> um, in these like more conventional ideas. But Diet Coke, like it was gonna be the millennial beverage for everybody. They were gonna recuperate it from being this like ladies diet drink. 
but like it doesn't work. So in March 2020, um, my mom actually showed it to me. My mommy's out there. Um, <laughs> that you know, it's, and, and that actually makes sense because the commercial is like drink, you know, what your mama gave you, right? Of like, you know, turning around and saying like, shake what your mama gave you. Um, and it's two young men like sitting down, and one of them saying like, Diet Coke, who are you, my mom? So they're like leaning into this idea that like Diet Coke's not right. It's not going to be this millennial beverage. It's always going to be this sort of retro like lady diet drink um and so how do we lean into that so i'm so interested in seeing how brands like flip flop um this idea of gender right when they feel like they can't get past these perceptions um I also, I had a section in the book on real men don't eat quiche, uh, which comes out in 1982 and it's like full of satire. Uh, but like so much of it is really serious, right? Of like this deep angst about how to be a real man when all of a sudden you're supposed to be sensitive and listen and parent more. So like it's coming out of the 80s, but like so much of what it's satirizing is still what we see playing out. Um, and so after that comes out, there are all these other spin-off books and one of them's a cookbook. So they're like leaning even harder. So like you're making fun of men and cooking and feminization at the same time that you're literally like providing recipes. Um, so I'm working on that too. Like that was supposed to be in the book and that ended up being sort of a separate piece that I'm working on. Um, and then in the book, like, you know, I was interested of how, you know, a lot of retired sports stars, right, were always the spokesmen, right? There's this leaning on the perceived masculinity of sports that we often see. Um, this idea of protein, right, being a part of like, all of us are supposed to eat like athletes. Um, so I've become increasingly really fascinated by this intersection of sports media and food media. So that's where I'm going for book two, um, to think, take all this food and not just gender, but like, like national identity these ideas about the United States and like look at them in that sports media space. Awesome. Well, this has been such a pleasure. So fun. I'm so jealous of your Zoom lighting. You guys look at, I mean, just Emily has this fantastic, it's, you can tell she's a teacher and has to do this all the time, but it has been my great pleasure to spend time with everyone this week or tonight. And thank you for all of your great questions. And please uh, click on the link and buy Emily's book. It matters to buy it from your local bookstore. So, so try to do it that way. Um, and I hope everyone- Buy Annie's book too. I have them both right? Like I devoured this, right? As a millennial woman to understand my burnout, right? I totally burnt out writing this book. <laughs> so no, I really, I recommend them both. Please buy them both. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Are we done? Yeah. Thanks everybody so much. Bye everyone.